Well, we didn't uh, expect this kind of crowd here. It's late afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> yep, we are here to talk talk a little about one series of hours, which is called called uh, the war is near. And uh, perhaps from the point of view of this kind of series, that has been a kind of regular thing in in uh, Ritrovato, meaning that we had uh, several series related to World War II, we had Cold War, atom bomb, cri financial crisis last year, and so on. And the, the uh, approach this year was uh, the, the the original name for the series, the working title was was uh, the years règle du jeu, and that. Uh, that makes it understandable to everybody who knows something about cinema, because uh, Regle the Renoir film, like also the Carnet film Le Jour Se Lève, are famous for being understood as some kind of seismographic images of their age. And uh, and what uh, what is perhaps the point of these programs? I think I think both both Olaf Möller and Alexander Horvath can explain better than me, is, is, uh, or is, they can maybe say that there's no sense of this, in this kind of programmation. But the, the idea has been to, to collect films that, that in a way reflect exactly their time. It's of course happening with, with, with every film to some degree. And this kind of programming means that, that uh, it is easier to put also mediocre films and sometimes relatively weak films to the series because they get, get some radiation from belonging exactly to that time. And as you have kind of probably understood while watching the program, these are not, not very tightly related to the theme, that they are kind of, it's often a question of interpretation whether, whether they really, the films we have here here, uh, to what degree they, they relate to the theme. Uh, they should, of course, because they are taken out of, out of much larger uh, uh, set of choices. Uh, Bernard Eisenschitz contributed uh, certainly 30, 40 titles, Olaf Möller did uh, another list and so on. So many people, in a way, like like we do in uh, Bologna, that we are in correspondence with, with uh, correspondence with good people and so on. So it's with, with each of these series along the years, it has been kind of painful process of, of showing. Then in the last analysis, we show absolutely too little. But on the other side, we know all too well that if we, we show several films, if we would show show twelve films or fifteen films, then then it would kind of disturb the other other programs, that this is, uh, this is something that works best with this kind of relatively minimal programmation, that it's one film every, every, every day. And one uh, very serious accident happened in the last minute, because we lost, lost uh, the film I, in a way, cherished most in the selection, and that was Paradis Perdue by Abel Gans and there was no print available, it's under, under restoration or something, then, then we didn't get permission to do any of the prints that were available. But maybe, Olaf, would you, would you have some comments about this? I don't speak more now. Uh, no, Alex has notes. I okay. guess he's much, he's much better prepared. So it's Alex. I have Absolutely. notes, but I have no comments. You're better in improvisational. Yes, we could, I mean, no. the main thing I would improvise is why are you here and not over there watching Rakba, the least interesting film by Bahram Bezai, which is still much more interesting than listening to us. Beyond that, I mean, it's, um, I mean, the thing with this kind of programming is that you're obviously just putting, by putting a title about something, that you're also giving it a kind of meaning that at the moment it may not have actually had, at least not in an active way, so to speak. When Peter asked me about the program, actually the things that came to my mind were films that were, let's say, far more actively talking about imminent war. I mean, stuff like uh, 
Belief's Tractoristi, which ends with the uh, tractor drivers singing, and if the enemy comes, we will turn our, our tractors into tanks. And it's quite obvious that everybody knew that the enemy was coming, which is one of the things that I find quite, that I found quite intriguing when thinking about the program, the fact that to a certain degree everybody knew that the Second World War was coming and quite a few hoped it would not happen, but I guess everybody was quite aware that whatever they hoped it would happen, which is, I mean, for me quite a fascinating thing to... Uh -huh. quite a fascinating thing to consider. I mean, if you I think it's 1918 with the second, the First World War ends. 38, 39, Second World War begins, and in between, you have 20 years where people are incessantly talking about the next war. I mean, it's, it's to a certain degree, it's a shame that there is no Japanese film in the program because, for Japan particularly, you would have a whole perspective on the subject that's quite frightening because I don't know how well aware you are for example about the fact that there was for example after World War One actually a whole, whole set of literature in Japan discussing in the next World War and I think one of Peter's favorite films by Preminger actually is about a guy who understood how World War Two from Japan side would begin and so there was this really this kind of mindset that this is going to happen. But then again, were people really always thinking about this? So it's for me, it's, it was quite quite an interesting challenge when Peter asked me about this, how to actually look at this program, finding stuff that's really more on the subliminal level, meaning stuff where we might even be just interpreting an insight that this is kind of a vision of World War II coming, or should one really look at the stuff that's really there? I mean, there's, for example, one French film that I, that I had proposed, both neither director nor title I can remember right now, but from 39, it's really about a film, about a science fiction film, a French, so therefore a rather rare thing, a French science fiction film, that's really about um, World War coming, and about catastrophe. Now, Alex. I improvised. Yes, uh, you know. improvised wonderfully, as you always do. I, I, I should say that I have no special knowledge of the cinema of those two years. And when, when Peter asked me to asked me to sit here, um, I told him that I'm not not in any way an expert on the cinema of, of this moment or or. No, but we, we perhaps, ever, perhaps uh, speak more about the principle, because you are a master programmer and you have done similar things in, in Vienna. So that's, that's what I said. I said that what I find really interesting is this notion of how can we today, in putting together retrospectives or programs or little interventions, how can a date uh, serve as a frame of reference that really produces a meaning beyond the, the factual, those films were all made or were all released um, on, in, a, in the same year or in the same short time frame. Um, and there are many ways to do that. I, I was in, when I saw the list that Peter and, and his consultants uh, in the end uh, brought together, I was immediately reminded of uh, a much smaller constellation that I, that I sometimes Austrian Film Museum sometimes has presented, which does include, of course, La Regle du Jeu, which is the, the film from which Peter's program started mentally. Uh, and I, I was trying to remember how, how, it, how it went about differently. Um, and while I think that the approach here is the much more interesting, because there is almost no, I mean, there are a few, but there is almost no direct um, commentary or, or uh, as Olaf said, it's more the subliminal. Uh, and what I did uh, two or three times is also to include things like actually Spare Time, the Humphrey Jennings film, which I'm very, very happy and grateful that, that you 
include this, this Jennings program. Spare time is always included, but also a film by Jerzy Weiss, The Rape of Czechoslovakia, which is a very straightforward um, political documentary about the short documentary about the, the time. And uh, a film, so this represents another format, the direct, let's say, propagandistic or anti propagandistic so called documentary film or short film. Um, which is not included in this program, and the other is Sadly a film enough. from. Sadly enough. The other is from a, is a film from 1946, Lubitsch's uh, Clooney Brown, which is set in the summer bef in England in the summer before the war begins, and it's uh, Charles Boyer is a Czech, I think Czech or Polish Czech Czech, Czech, Czech exile uh, in in this bourgeois British home. Uh, where nobody, where it's actually the opposite that Olaf said, nobody really believes that war will be coming or that this, hit, hit, this Hitler with some very funny lines is being looked at by these upper middle class Brits as, a, as this weird, weird guy from, from Germany. Um, and it's a, it's a romantic comedy. It's Jennifer Jones is, is a plumber's daughter and of course Charles Boyer and Jennifer Jones in the end become an item. Um, but what is great is that from hindsight, uh, actually I don't know if it's hindsight as Olaf said or hindsight. Okay, I won. Um, you have you <laughs> Dave Care, language consultant. Is um, it only American or also British? <laughs> anyway, it's a film from '46. It's a film from made the year or released the year after the war, set in the summer before the war in England as is Spare Time. For me, Humphrey Jennings, great, great film. He made that uh, a few months uh, before war began and before his much more famous uh, films relating to London during, during the Second World War and to the war effort uh, were made. So um, there are two, these, these are two examples of, me, of what I'm trying to say when mentioning this is, the temp is to talk about the various temporalities of cinema. Cinema has these um, layered temporalities and one is of course to say okay this is moment X. Uh, films, These films were made but that already the complication begins scripted at which time, made, shot at which time, released at which time because yeah. Saint Landemar came out uh, when the war was already going on for half a year um, Menas, as I read in the catalog, the, at least the version that people are seeing here came yeah. out in 45. Yeah. Uh, so th the production of cinema as such already produces these different temporalities in, in the terms of which phase, which moment actually does relate to the, to the political uh, present. And then there are these other temporalities, meaning what, what happens if we pick films from much later or actually films from much earlier who are science fiction in a way who, who address a certain, you know, when Blade Runner starts there is a year, I don't know what it is, 2012 or 18, anyway it will be a year that we'll soon have or, or maybe we already had it. So um, there are... Things to come which is yeah. 1936 and predicts the blitz. Yeah. Right. So, it's, it's so exactly. that greatness. What you what you write, and what I totally agree with, Peter, in in your general introduction to this series, is the 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 ways in which this medium can speak about a, a moment in time that we that we have that we know in a way mostly through what we learned in history lessons or in on history television, various channels. That cinema has this capacity to complicate, to enrich to make much more, um, yeah, to enrich is the best word, uh, our notion of history. And then there would be even a few more, I would say, ways in which engaging with, with film history, with past films, with more recent films, with film from, films from different points in time, addressing one point in time, that, that could go even further. So this is just my two cents in terms of this, this Clooney Brown idea that uh, of course, many types of films, and this, this thing of many types of films, like the Yeshivais film, what happens if we see, for instance, there is this great uh, 
it's not great. It's an awful film, of course, but it's a great moment of, of early propagandistic. I think Uchitsky was was involved in the making of this. There are two films made about the Anschluss of Austria in the spring of 1938. One is Wort und Tat, and the other is Ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer. Wort und Tat means word and deed, or word and act, and the other one means a people, an empire, a leader. And uh, we have these types of materials that were shot by amateurs in the March of 38, all kinds of amateurs. We have these two propagandistic uh, 10, 10 or 12 minute German films that celebrate Hitler on the Heldenplatz and Austria is finally part of the uh, uh, empire again. Reich. Reich. It was called Reich. And then, and then we have all these not all, it's not that many actually, but there are also Hollywood anti-Nazi films that refer to the Anschluss. Yeah. Uh, so you have, uh, I think it, one is, it's, if I'm not mistaken, in John Cromwell's So Ends the Night, uh, Glenn Ford is, a, is a, a resistance fighter, a refugee, it's too long that I've seen the film. So these types of films also relate to the Anschluss. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm wondering what the best way would be, no matter, it's not only about 38, 39, what the best way would be to portray this. And the great thing is you find out there are 12 or 212 best or great ways to deal with it if you take all of cinema. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm aiming at that. Really try and also take a Land Life film. It maybe sounds silly to look at abstract cinema or to look at avant-garde cinema that way, but my, my tendency would be also to see how the most non-mimetic, non-realist types of films could also contribute to this to this texture to what we try to find are these textures these these materialities in which some some knowledge seems seems to reside that we don't get from the history books hmm. well this was quite quite wonderful i mean it, it makes uh, makes uh, you dream immediately about the 50 film uh, series where all these time temporalities would be kind of involved and in a way that Testimony on all levels of cinema would be concentrated. Including SF, Brown. Including SF Parati. Including yeah. SF Parati. It was something I was always fascinated by. It's a Finnish film from 1939. It was basically finished shortly before the Winter War broke out. And it portrays Helsinki, kind of almost a kind of semi fictional, semi realist Helsinki, really in the last summer, so to speak, of peace. And it was brought out after the Winter War which took only four months. So I was always fascinated by this idea that there's an extremely small time span so that people in 1940 would sit in the cinema and look at 1939 at a film that was essentially saying that everything is kind of all right, although everybody seems to be running around in a uniform, which is also kind of disturbing. And what, what was going on in people at that moment, looking at looking at that? It's really a span of, and I don't know, maybe six months, seven months between when the film was finished and when the film hit the theatres, but there's really a whole war in between, with ravages on the city that is portrayed there. Mm. But I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, one point about Clooney Brown, because, uh, because uh, all of you are always, always quoting to be or not to be, but there is a similarly great joke in, in Clooney Brown that Hitler, isn't he the fellow who wrote the book My Camp? My Camp. My Camp, yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's, it's a film for anyone who loves, rightly loves, to be or not to be. I think it's an equally great late Lubitsch that, that mm. also politically they should be really yeah. seen to, together. When you mentioned this, this terrible Uchichi films, uh, films, so I immediately thought uh, another film which is very little known, but Dozhenko made a film about uh, liberation of Ukraine, and he, he, his heart couldn't be in that. I mean that I have seen it in, in Ukraine, in the Dozhenko symposium, they showed only that film out of the whole Dozhenko oeuvre, which was probably his worst film. And, and then somebody was all the time saying to me, these are those these pictures are lies. They are lies. lies they are uh, kind of active seeds and so on. So so these things happened that it was kind of uh, not the moment of uh, like uh, like there's this line in Regal du Jeu that uh, the worst thing is that everybody is lying. So so cinema also was lying to the maximum at that time, and that's uh, perhaps one of the. 
things leading to this kind of the key to this kind of series. I think it's also Although it's relative. I mean, as a, I mean, if we say that we are by putting a title over the films that we make them, let's say, readable in a certain fashion, one might just as well say that um, we can, through a kind of title like that, read something in them, some proofs that maybe are there accidentally or whatever, but um, I guess cinema might have been quite truthful in its lying, so that the lie might be actually the key truth there. So I mean, whatever Ushitsky was saying there, he was very, very correct about his lies, so it's true lies. Yeah. It's also a notion, I think, in some way that in Godard's Histoire du Cinéma, this, uh, that cinema in a way was always too late and that the documentaries and the newsreels try to save save something uh, but he's, he's sort of negative or pessimistic in, in his feeling uh, in term about cinema's capacity to tell history or to be or at least to tell it uh, before it's too late mm. maybe that's that's in this in this questioning of truthfulness and and lying there's also this question of can we only today look back at the films from that era and and have an interesting and rich experience or should we also criticize the cinema for n not being able most of the time to play a real role because as cinephiles we often fancy ourselves or we fancy a certain political edge of cinema that may not really have been there even in the maybe this what i'm it's, it's a complex thing but maybe it's only an af, it's something after that we can also 68 for instance if we look at the cinema of 68 there is a lot to be seen and to be talked about there but uh because you have chris Marker in this in this festival and and he took part for a certain period in movements and in collective activity which attempted through the help of the machinery of cinema and of the working with cinema to find alliances between groups in society that were generally not allied. Uh, the question is how, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm sounding like a conservative pessimist when saying this, but I, mm. I could not, for truth's sake, say that too many of these activities led to, to something um, um, that, that was worthwhile for a longer period than just a moment, which, on the other hand, is also the what what I like to call the utopia of cinema, that it does not ever become, as soon as it becomes the dominant, if some that's propaganda. If, if as soon as, as the the coalition between politics and cinema making becomes the dominant force, then we have Uchitsky and and those and or the Dovshenko of 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 the early 40s so the utopia is also always there that you try for a brief moment it never becomes the dominant force but it is there for us two or three or five generations later to see these energies that remain in these films be they may 68 films or be they saint lendemain uh, which never addresses the the current political situation but which is such a strong um, it relates in such a strong fashion a, a moment of true desperation, which here is private desperation or negativity or darkness or, or a suicidal impulse, uh, the impossibility to reach, to reach any hopeful shore. And we know this in the wider world, this, the same thing happened in mm -hmm. terms of the war beginning or having already begun when saint Lanima had entered the, the theaters. Yeah. Well, I would at least say there that the question is maybe not uh, of, the, of the power or potentials of cinema and maybe a question of um, the use of the film, meaning it's, uh, I would certainly question more the, um, the way that, let's say, cinema was used in 68, than cinema's potential to be of some uh, Use. So it's. Uh, I tend to be optimistic about cinema and pessimistic about the rest. Um, it's a, a couple of quotes from from films. So in, in uh, Battle of San Pietro, there's a line uh, line 
written by John Huston that uh, when you are facing death then, then the camera camera then are filming that the camera doesn't lie then. So so I think referring to Olaf so so people knew then that there would be probably war that it's, it was some kind of almost certainty. So so uh, well one thing is to say that cinema was lying as it often is but at the same time, filmmakers probably were even with extreme entertainment. They were more serious than usually, like they were in the in the war period. And and then another quote comes from from the ending of uh, Chronic de Nete, the Jean Rouge and Morin film. Edgar Morin and Jean Rouge discuss in the in the ending of the film that maybe this these and these people lied or so, and then, then they decide that it doesn't matter that the lies were as significant yeah. as the truth. So this is kind of the ambivalence in, in this kind of series. So oh, and, I mean, one thing, one thing we always have to remember is, I mean, we are looking at these things obviously with our own ideological agenda. I mean, we might find it disturbing when you've got basically always kind of glorification of, uh, let's say, armed forces or something like that. But I mean, we might have to also face the fact that uh, we are looking at a period of time where people were, I mean, let's say the majority of people were actually quite fascinated, but still fascinated by the whole army culture. I mean, I think I remember some text by Jean Pierre Jean, Col uh, Jean, -Pierre Jean Collat. From early 70s, where he's talking about French cinema of the 30s and French culture of that period, where he's saying that essentially knowing who was the garrison commander of every given town was something normal in France. But it was kind of considered, yes, you knew these people and they were people of respect. So obviously, this, I guess, is also visible in these films, and we might at times have really kind of we are unwilling to enter that kind of frame of mind, which of course is our problem and not the problem of the films. And it's really, a, 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 I think probably, I haven't thought about this, but it, our culture is a very rare case in which the military is so incredibly marginalized. It wouldn't, for an American for instance, it would be different already, but in Europe we have found a that's what, what I'm, I'm trying to reinforce what you said, our ideological agenda in, in Europe being that anything related to the military should be on the margin and we simply do not because give this any, maybe rightfully so, but maybe stupidly so, give this any segment or role in, in, in social life, whereas in before, in also in the Cold War, but it much more before that, it was a much stronger presence. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's basically really kind of, a, I wouldn't say a leftover, but kind of the, the last vestiges almost of the 19th century, which had this extraordinary, complex and deeply embedded, so to speak, military culture in society. So it's what is like the last vestiges where it's really coming up and with World War II it's at least for a certain time kind of pacified and even if you are more interested, I'm just talking nonsense, you can basically put that over there. Um, when it was kind of considered pacified, I mean, we should remember that the kind of anti-war movement starts much earlier, but it really kind of almost took two world wars to get people to settle down a bit about this whole war thing, and then they really didn't. I mean, I think it's still true that there wasn't a single day without war in the whole time 20th century which is kind of a pretty frightening, pretty frightening thought. So it's, I mean, I'm right now working on, uh, on another project for another festival about essentially revolutions and uprisings. And it's actually also an eight, an eight, an eight slot series. And suddenly you are facing the fact that you are dealing with several hundreds of uprisings, and you also see that there was not a single day in the second um, in the 20th century without civil unrest, without people in one way or another trying to rise against oppression. So I mean, what what, what kind of century is that? It's constantly at war, and people are constantly rising against uh, oppression. I mean, oh, were we fucked? Mm. 
Well, it's it's true, it's true certainly, but but somehow these these years seem to have in a way compress everything. This yes, 30, 38, 39, because it, somehow the drama, the real drama, is is there. And of course, this this situation, it's it's a, it's a, quite impossible to separate the militaristic aspect from the national feelings. Yeah. That it, it happened in every country that the nationalistic feeling came up, and so there are there are whole genre formations that, in a way, were influenced by this war. The, this, this years, the the the, the renovation, the, the new Western, the new approach to Western was born exactly then. It was it was stagecoach, and and even the Michael Curtis. Westerns, in a way, they have kind of hints of, of of the world situation, like like his pirate movies, in the same way. And and then, of course, there there were the biopics yeah. in every country, in Germany, in in the States. They were they made uh, in 1939 uh, alone, I think, I think three films about Abraham Lincoln were made. Not only the John, famous John Ford film, but but two other films. So that that was one thing, and it, 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 well, I I know from from Finnish movies, which uh, nobody else here here knows except Olaf, who knows them better than I do. So so they always ended every historical film which related to Finnish history of the 19th century or so that it all ended ended with a couple of minutes of something that was directly against uh, Soviet Union, and it was kind of. They were then, then partly banned after the war, after the, what happened in the war, because of their aggressivity and in the end. So they were, in spite of being historical films, they were very directly. And that was one, one genre, of course. Alexander Nevsky is the famous example of, of a film that was absolutely to the point, and that was already in, in, in 30, 38, and it was all about Second World War already. But there is also. I wonder if we are, if this tends to have a certain teleology built into it. We look at, if one decides to do a, a series about this topic, one goes through various, many, many films, I guess, you both did, and uh, looks for certain uh, elements in which, in which the expected or approaching war can be seen. But I was, I thought yesterday with the Ophüls film, um, I was reminded uh, on reading a uh, long time ago about uh, the cinema of the Popular Front and the years after in France, and this one of the real birthplaces of, of film noir also. Um, so you could also look at the French films maybe of, of these same years um, as referring backwards to the Popular Front, to the hopes of the Popular Front, to the cultural hopes of the Popular Front, and to them not succeeding in, in, in a way. And what, what happened when Quai de Brume and Chouselev, and I guess also this film, but since this came out already during the war, maybe it was different, but there were several films coming out in 30, 37, 38, which the conservative press or the mainstream press called defeatist. Mm -hmm. um, so this was a real harsh cultural debate. Uh, I think also, if I remember correctly, that parts of the left called these films defeatist because they were, of course, also not very not giving hope in the sense that the Popular Front would have wanted to before. So Carnet and and the Gabin films and a certain climate that is now that film history calls poetic realism or that we we can call it part of film noir is a defeatist, is seen, was seen as a defeatist cinema and also censorship, I think, I, I'm, I'm just saying this without concrete fact, but I'm sure there were uh, several instances when films were so dark or so defeatist that they could not, not come out that way. So that may relate not to the feeling of the coming war, or not only, but it may also relate to the dashed hopes of a, of a it's a just previous moment in time, the mid the mid 1930s. If you think of uh, La Vie et à Nous, and if you think of of the spirit that a kind of mid 30s cinema, at least parts of mid Renoir and, and parts of the mid 30s cinema had produced in France, this reaction, this feeling of of negation, um, 
has also this other element, not only the relation to the to the coming war. Which of course reminds me of, uh, let's say, yet another, now that you're mentioning censorship um, aspect in this. Obviously that we have in many cases different versions, so that we are today looking at different films than people were looking at that time. If we can at sometimes, let's say, reconstruct to a certain degree uh, what they were, but uh, I'm not really certain whether it would be possible to basically reconstruct them, these films on the material level. Um, for example, thinking about um, one of my favorite subjects, Fight Harlan, who after World War II was basically cut down severely in Germany to make the films still usable in the post-war climate. And what was edited out were tons of obvious racial slurs. So that we have to now reconstruct, if we see the films, they look kind of almost harmless. If we look at, if we would see them in the original uh, version, we would actually look at a very different, let's say, almost social climate, where it's almost kind of normal to, um, to insult whole, race, uh, whole races, whole nations, etc. It was kind of there and considered also as something you could do, which is also something that I find quite, in a kind of tricky way, very fascinating. Same with a friend of mine, to give an example, recently found out that she's the granddaughter of the biggest anti-Semite in Frankfurt, and that her grandfather opened the first anti-Semitic hotel in Frankfurt. So, I mean, imagine that people could book themselves into an anti-Semitic hotel. That's also kind of a climate that has kind of almost vanished from the films and therefore also from the way we look at that time because also we have more of them not problems if the films are still complete to look at them because it's kind of not an exactly fun experience. Are you saying that these earlier versions do no longer exist of the Fight Thailand films? That's or? a good question. Actually, I'm not really certain. I really don't know. I mean, I know that they were, um, that the films were edited. I know that, for example, from uh, Die Reise nach Tilsit, the anti-Polish slurs were cut out, the anti-Czech slurs were cut out from Die Goldene Stadt, etc. Also from some of the other films, I know that the straightforward um, anti-this or that comments were taken out. In a strange way, so the, the best example that we have is actually Jutsus, because that's still intact. Mm -hmm. um, so with the others, I never saw a print of uh, any of these films containing all of these anti, uh, this, that, whatever slurs. So I guess, yes, these are lost. We can only check from the, uh, from the censorship cards what, the, what they were saying at a certain moment. Well, it's fascinating that the, the films of that period seem to, be, to become recut uh, to, to maximum degree. The same with, with Soviet yes. films, when all the Stalin sequences were cut out later, the Mihal Rom films and so on. So. Well, about the pacifist aspect, so I wonder if, if that approach was, was more to the point in the early 30s, when Lubitsch made The Man I Killed, and there were pacifist films, and it somehow seems seems to end with La Grande Illusion and, and the second version of Jacques the Abel Gans film, which has this tremendous ending when, when he uses the real uh, real uh, faces of the the war wounded, wounded in the film, that is one of the most tremendous sequences. But, but otherwise the pacifism kind of disappeared. Am, am I entirely wrong about that? I guess one of the things is that the pacifism was, let's say, always a rather embattled position. I guess even more embattled than the, let's say, bellicist uh, position. I mean, it's still a culture where, uh, let's say, bellicism, as I think this is actually kind of a new word, not from me, but in only the last years, bellicism was actually kind of considered more acceptable due to the military culture than the kind of um, Pacifism. I guess the pacifism was usually more or less loaded with the uh, notion it's from the left, meaning again from something new and something that, let's say, the dominant discourse of the time, which I think is not exactly necessarily progressive, felt very uncomfortable with. I mean, 
it may not have been necessarily progressive, but it seems very clear that if the years before 1933 were the years in which pacifism in cinema was the strongest. If you yeah. look at Niemandsland and Kameradschaft, and yeah. you have you have a, a real I think there is a large group of films uh, relating all to the First World War. It's, yeah. a, it's about yeah. a 10, or 10 to 15 year period after the First World War and you have this strong, uh, also maybe internationalist, Niemandsland is a good example of that, and, and Westfront, these strong internationalist emotions and, and activity and hopes. And I think that uh, January, the, 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 the La Prise de Pouvoir of the Nazis it put an end to that simply because uh, both in Italy and, and, and Japan and, and Germany in, in those cultures you had a, 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 a rather aggressive, I mean Olaf knows more about this, but militarization and I think that also in the other countries you had the feeling that more uh, effort and energy and, and weaponry may, may be needed. So I think it's, it's 33 that actually begins this other trend uh, where something like Grand Illusion is already a very late comer <laughs> in a way yeah. to a to a moment in where in culture everything had gone the other direction already. Well, I should say that pointing to 33 is kind of not that you mention Japan, of course, a very westernized look at that because Japan at that point is already uh, at war for two years. For example, in Japan, this was already kind of tricky. And I think the films you mentioned, yes, these films were made, of course, but what we forget is also that there were a lot of pro-war movies or films that were by far not as clearly anti-war as these films were. And so that, because that's what I was trying to say, that I mean, these anti-war movies, we kind of, re this is the stuff we remember from that period maybe rightly so, but um, what we rarely look at, what we have, might have forgotten, what we have probably never really even properly studied, are really the, actually what's just size-wise far, far more important, just size-wise, actually this whole cinema of war that at that point existed. I mean, we should, for example, also remember that there is, of course, the aspect, what you say, internationalist, but it also has a kind of a certain edge into a different direction that was the kind of gentlemanly understanding between, let's say, soldiers of different nations. So you would find films that we could consider balances that still also have this kind of aspect, this aspect of um, gentlemanly warfare. So the, then so we are talking about a really very, very almost broad gray area. And I mean, we are mainly looking at the, let's say, at the outer reaches of the two areas, so to speak, the are more or less black and white. We are, but with this gray zone, it's actually far, 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 far bigger and a far more complex subject, so to speak, to deal with. I mean, how does a director like Heinz Paul, who is a World War I uh, veteran and definitely a nationalist uh, um, propagandist, blah, blah, blah. Uh, definitely a, also a pro-army guy, suddenly makes a film really about this kind of uh, understanding again between a German and a British soldier that looks almost as if it would fit snugly along, uh, alongside something like Niemandsland. But if you look at it in the context of the Paul oeuvre, it looks quite different, or it gives different shades. Well, it's interesting that, that, that the, 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 the outstart of the war, in a way, divides uh, films into two, because before that uh, there were films about peace that the uh, really about war and then then uh, then comes it's I, I think the Humphrey Jennings films are a good example they are really peaceful films when, when uh, in many cases war is not even mentioned and in many countries then war, during the war then, then there was a compulsive need to make films that were peaceful and not, not uh, even even they were contemporary films that there was something that there was a Finnish film that during the first five minutes there is one kind of like uh, short, uh, 
sound effect about bombing or something, but that's the only hint to the, to the war. And that was typical. So, so it's, um, it's interesting that, that uh, interesting example that, that film is always, always uh, the art of the invisible, that it's all, always uh, something that uh, in most beautiful cases it's told by, by contrasts and told by opposites, that it's, it's, it's showing other things that it really kind of shows. But that wouldn't really, I think if I, from my gut, feeling the American cinema of uh, 41, after 41, that would not hold true for that, right? Because the war was very consciously taken into the, as a subject into the American film industry of 42, 43. Y yes, Mr. 42. Kerr, please. Please. Mr. Bring the subject back to Alan Dwan, as it should be. Uh, we were showing one of his World War II uh, period, the screwball comedies, where he very carefully excluded any mention of the war. <coughs> And I believe the one we're showing is going to be concerned, oh no, this is not another war picture. Uh, Please. It's about the battle Please. of the sexes. Uh, sorry. That was the end yeah. of my point. Yeah. Uh, but there was certainly a whole school of people, one among them, who thought the audience had had enough mm. of this propaganda film. And yeah. to show you something else. And in fact, he parodies that attitude in this film. Yeah. But on the other hand, saying that the audience, that they are reacting against what the audience um, has seen, in a, let's say in a twisted way, makes them kind of films about the war. If you look aggressively away, like the war is going on over there, you, you cannot fail to notice the war. But there's something going on there. If somebody is staring like a maniac in that direction because you're wondering why on earth is he staring only in that direction does he have a bad neck um, so you know I mean it's that's a tricky thing with what basically this kind of looking at films you can always obviously find a reason why it's actually exactly the opposite so I mean saying that um, they were almost aggressively somebody's making aggressively a film excluding the war makes it very much a film of the war, so to speak, mm. which is kind of a truism, but hey, why not say a truism for Christ's sake? Yo! Okay, please. Shall I take the blindfold so I can speak? No, no, no. Use a microphone, it's fun. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, yeah, going on from just, just there, I mean, I, I'm glad that Olaf mentioned uh, a couple of times about Japan's war started in 37, but surely the point is, it's China. Uh, no, 31, I'm thinking about well, the invasion of China. That, but my, my big point is, surely it was China's war. I mean, the war was happening in China, which we haven't mentioned. And surely, from a large part of the globe, the Second World War starts in 37. Um, that... Um, and certainly, if you uh, were, you know, if you went to the cinema in these times, you would be getting newsreels with plenty of war going on in China, and this is not captured. This is not portrayed in these films that you're talking about. I'm looking forward to seeing many of these films, and I appreciate this, this series. But if you're saying, you know, that looking away is a way of of emphasising it, are we saying that all of European films are Looking, looking so hard away from China. I don't know. I think, I think there is a an aspect here that ch what happens in China is not part of the body politic. It certainly wasn't in these fictional films. It was in the newsreels. It was there, um, not in the fictional films, not in what we're looking at yet, even now. The Earth. Hmm? The Earth was a tremendous bestseller in '36 and became a big MGM film. In Good Earth. It's mentioned by Dave Kahn. Thirty-seven. Yeah. Yeah. But on the other hand, let me put it like that: Couldn't we also? Isn't we, do we also get to have a touchy subject here, which is one of racism, meaning that? Well, I didn't say that, but yes. Yes, of course. But um, hey, let's put. We we are not talking with kid gloves on here. We are bare knuckle fighters, mm -hmm. of course. Um, we should also not forget that there was something going on in, the, in, a, in a place called Spain. And I guess that took or drew a lot of, let's say, attention away from what was going on in this 
far, far, far away place with these small people who we are used to look at as servants, you know, so it's probably the ugly truth is that the, basically the, the Spanish Civil War almost clouded the view of the war in China. I mean, probably it's also fair to say that we probably, at that point in time, I mean, what kind of idea did people have about China or Japan, for that matter? So it's, it's a tricky subject. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very tricky subject because it basically tells us a lot about our, let's say, our culture's interests and views of that region, so to speak. Okay. I mean, Japan is already in 32 making films about uh, global warfare in the whole of uh, Southeast and East Asia, I mean, for Christ's sake. I mean, it's, uh, but I mean, who saw that? Who saw, who saw these people, who saw these films here? I guess not even specialists or diplomats, for that matter, didn't know this kind of stuff. Um, it was mentioned in Russian film journals at the time, this is what they're making in Japan, and we did see the Porta as well. Yeah. Yeah, but we should also not forget that uh, Russia at that point also had its, let's say, had some business with the East. I mean, talking about films that were censored, I mean, there is of course, or let's say, it didn't even make it. It was a film by Gabriel Rappaport, um, Ghost, The Guest, which um, was finished and then due to a political situation immediately shelved and was shelved so perfectly that it was even considered not made at some point. So it's, um, why was it basically shelved? Because it basically alluded to warfare with, um, with, uh, with the East. I think it was a, was a Japanese, I think it was a Japanese uh, uh, agent entering Russia. So it's, um, obviously they were looking at that region because also because of the Japanese, Russo-Japanese war, there was also still open, some open wounds and some unfinished business, so to speak, and both sides knew that. I mean, for Japan, the big discussion was Russia or the US, whom do we attack? Okay, thank you. Time is up, up uh, and, uh, well, I would ask, uh, you being the most knowledgeable public I can imagine, so write on a paper, small papers, films that you would feel would belong to the series we are having here, your ideas. I, I'm, I, I just got so curious that how many films there are which could relate, and maybe in the large sense that Alex mentioned in the beginning, because it's, it, may, it would make sense, it would be interesting to, to get a long, long list of that. And, uh, and perhaps, perhaps this very modest selection, which is only, only six, seven films, extremely modest, is, is anyway a think, beginning of a thinking process about the method of, of this kind of uh, programming. As I said, it's, it's a way to get... A festival can't concentrate only to masterpieces. And there must be methods, methods to, to show films that have electrified their meaning, films that otherwise are not considered at all. So, so we must also find them. Thank you.